Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, my name is Tom Wright and I direct the Center on the United States and Europe here at the Brookings Institution. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar to launch a terrific new book on the French President Emmanuel Macron entitled The Last President of Europe, Emmanuel Macron's Race to Revive France and Save the World. This book is written by our colleague Bill Drosiak. Bill is a non-resident senior fellow here at Brookings and a senior advisor for Europe at McClarty Associates. He was previously the president of the American Council on Germany, a journalist for over two decades with the Washington Post, and he got a start in transatlantic relations playing professional basketball in Europe and the United States in the 1970s. Uh, the Last President of Europe will be published in a few days. You can buy it online today at your independent bookstores or Amazon or wherever you prefer uh, to uh, purchase, and it will be delivered uh, on, the, on the publication date, which I think is uh, April 28th. Um, Bill has written a truly intimate portrait of President Macron at a profound moment of crisis in Europe and around the world. Today, as we sit here, we're just 24 hours away from a crucial uh, European TELUS summit um, in which Macron will play a leading role tomorrow to craft the EU's response uh, to the coronavirus, so the timing could not be better. While writing the book, Bill had unique access to President Macron. In fact, he met with him uh, several times over the last 18 months and spent countless hours um, with his advisors and research and reporting in Paris. The final product is a fascinating, well-informed account of the French president, which demonstrates his ambition to transform France and Europe, but also highlights the daunting challenges he faces in implementing his plans at home and abroad. Our team at Brookings had the privilege of hosting President Macron and getting a glimpse of this vision back in the summer of 2015, when he was relatively unknown, yet a particularly thoughtful and motivated economy minister. Today's webinar is part of an ongoing partnership between Brookings and the Robert Bosch Stiftung, what we call the Brookings Bosch Transatlantic Initiative, or BBTI. BBTI is a multi-year project that seeks to reinvigorate transatlantic cooperation on global challenges. Events like this would not be possible without the support and partnership we have with Bosch, and we're very grateful to our partners who understand and respect our independence and recognize the value we offer through independent scholarship. Our stellar panel today includes Bill, um, author of the book, of course, our French visiting fellow, Celia Ballon, our German senior fellow, Constanza Stelzenmüller, and our visiting fellow from Italy, Giovanna De Maio. It will be moderated um, by uh, my colleague Fiona Hill, a senior fellow here at Brookings and my predecessor uh, of the Center on the United States and Europe. So as a final housekeeping item, please feel free to send your questions to events at brookings.edu or on Twitter using the hashtag BBTI. And with that, um, Bill, congratulations on the book. And I would like to turn it over to you to give a brief overview and then Fiona will chair the discussion. Thank you. Sorry, Bill, you need to unmute yourself. All right, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Tom, uh, for that kind introduction and my thanks to my Brookings colleagues for uh, participating in this event. Uh, to, uh, to mark the, uh, the launch of my book. When I embarked on this project uh, two years ago, I thought it would be fascinating to study a leader uh, who had never been elected before to uh, a political office, had ascended to uh, the French presidency, and also... You, they cannot hear you. Unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, th so that... Uh, when uh, we embarked, he had these uh, Herculean ambitions to uh, uh, modernize France, uh, revitalize Europe, and reshape the world order. And I, I thought it would be fascinating to follow him uh, during the course of uh, the early part of his presidency to see how this would uh, work out. And uh, I've structured the book in such a way that it uh, serves as a chronicle of his uh, education and power in a way uh, 
uh, starting with his uh, very rapid start as president, which he uh, pushed through some uh, remarkable reforms and then ran into uh, uh, the resistance uh, personified by the Gilets Jaunes, the, the Yellow Vest Movement, which uh, stunned him uh, with its ferocity and really pushed him into a, a depression that he isolated himself in the Elysee and then showed resilience uh, in coming out of that, um, of that, uh, that depression and, and embarking on a round of town halls called the Great National Debate, which, uh, which brought him out of this, uh, of this uh, period when some people thought his presidency was in mortal danger. The second part of the book deals with uh, his efforts to revitalize Europe, uh, trying to uh, uh, push back against the populist nationalists, not just Marine Le Pen in his own country, but also uh, Matteo Salvini and uh, what he represented in Italy, and also uh, uh, Victor Urban in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, I go into, uh, in some length, uh, the difficult relationship he had with Angela Merkel, which uh, started out with great hope that uh, the French of the German tandem would lead Europe into uh, uh, a bold new uh, initiative uh, to, uh, to unify the con continent, yet it uh, ran into political difficulties. Merkel's uh, uh, difficult uh, relationship with her coalition partners in, in Berlin, but also skepticism about Macron's ideas. And uh, I recount in the conversations I have with him about how this also uh, uh, made him feel isolated as the last leader in Europe who really had a truly uh, strategic vision for Europe and his difficulties in convincing his European partners to share this. And then the final section of the book is about his interactions on the world stage with such leaders as Donald Trump, uh, Xi Jinping, and uh, Vladimir Putin, and how he thought it would be important for Europe uh, to unify in order to compete in this resurgent big power rivalry that we are seeing today. And the final chapter is called Macron Alone, in which I draw him out in a long, fascinating discussion about geopolitics and where he thinks the world will be over the next three decades um, and why it's important for, uh, for Europe to unify in order to, uh, to compete. And, and this last conversation I had with him took place in September of last year when, in which he was in a very despondent mood. He was saying, uh, in fact, that he felt that uh, Europe was not ready for the next big crisis. He didn't know what it would be, but he felt that this would be something that would, would test Europe and, and possibly push it to the breaking point unless uh, the 27 leaders uh, somehow mobilized and came together and, and found a way to, uh, to coalesce behind his uh, strategic vision. And what we see today now with the corona crisis, uh, he's had, uh, his popularity has greatly improved, his ratings uh, have greatly improved because uh, as, as other leaders have seen happen as people rally around their governments to deal with this crisis. Uh, and he's spoken to the French people on four occasions, talking about this as a test of war, uh, and it, frankly admitting that his government was not prepared, uh, that, uh, that France has had uh, a, a great shortage of, of masks and protective equipment, as we've seen in our own country here, um, but also focusing on how he is trying to galvanize the international community for more actions in his conversations with uh, President Trump. He, he pleaded with him to, uh, to uh, launch a, a, a joint uh, project for the G7 uh, group of uh, industrialized democracies. Uh, Trump, uh, who has the presidency of the G7 this year, said he's uh, too busy with other things. Why don't you organize it for me? So Macron has found himself uh, again after holding the presidency last year trying to organize G7 summits. And now tomorrow, as you point out, there will be a critical meeting at, of the European Union leaders uh, trying to come up with a trillion dollar plus recovery fund, which would heal the breach between the wealthy Northern countries and uh, the poor, uh, poorer, more indebted 
countries of the South. And this is really something that people have talked about in the last few weeks, which could, which could push Europe to the breaking point. Uh, and Trump is uh, of that, and Macron is trying to uh, heal this breach, and we'll see how it uh, it plays out. But uh, all in all, it's been a uh, fascinating exercise to see how this youthful uh, president, now only 42, um, has tried to put France and Europe back in the game of uh, big power uh, competition uh, with a lot of uh, uh, with a, a remarkable roller coaster ride of some successes and some failures. Well, that's uh, wonderful, Bill. Um, this is Fiona um, coming in, Fiona Hill, to uh, do the moderation. Um, I really hope that everyone who is listening today will have a chance uh, to read your book and that it will be considered an essential item for um, mailing. Um, as we know these days, um, it's a little bit difficult to order things. And I just also wanted to give a shout out to everybody who's listening and uh, hoping that everyone's staying well and safe at this difficult time and appreciate you all joining us uh, today. I think um, you know, Bill's book has really uh, shaped uh, a very important picture of someone who is going to be playing an increasingly pivotal role as we look at uh, the ways that Europe is going to get out of the uh, effects of the pandemic and may in fact um, also play a larger role in shaping uh, perhaps a global response if he's able to pull off uh, some of uh, the interactions that Bill is, uh, has just discussed. I'd like to turn over very quickly uh, to Celia uh, Bellin, our visiting fellow from France. Uh, Celia has uh, been following uh, Macron's uh, trajectory very closely as well, and uh, also some of his interactions uh, with um, the United States as well as other Europeans. And I Celia that uh, you'll be able to offer us a, a fresh perspective from how it looks like from France now in terms of um, Macron's leadership style, how effective it's proving to be in this time of crisis. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, thank you, Bill, also for uh, this excellent book. I enjoyed it uh, thoroughly and uh, I hope you all will read it and enjoy it. I, um, I thought I would offer three quick points and hopefully get you to react as well, Bill, and, and give your own perspective because you had the unique ch chance to discuss uh, directly with uh, Emmanuel Macron. My first point is on leadership style, indeed, uh, because it seems to be that the book um, sh sheds a very interesting light on how Macron is as a president, and that we see that a particularly particular behavior uh, during the time of crisis of COVID as um, a, a very unique moment uh, to appreciate it. And uh, my impression was that uh, Macron had made the conscious decision of behaving presidential immediately after arriving. So you mentioned how he gets inspired by De Gaulle, how he took some distance from the press, how he got um, his nickname Jupiter for being um, uh, maybe too uh, locked up in his uh, Elysee Palace uh, for a long time. And then he, he had this behavior, um, it, it came out of a, a will to contrast himself from uh, President Sarkozy, who he considered was too susceptible to public opinion, but also uh, to President Hollande, of which he was a very close um, associate and, and advisor at the Elysee Palace. And he considered that Hollande was too close to the press and also susceptible to public opinion. So Macron really tried to take that distance, but it, there was also a strong backlash. Uh, you remember uh, after the Yellow Vest crisis that Macron was judged arrogant and out of touch and tone deaf and, um, and he, yet it seems that some of these same instincts at the beginning of COVID, you know, he talked about war, he was a wartime president. And once again, he seemed to have to be like um, uh, very high up and maybe too far from people's preoccupation. And every time after facing death crisis and facing this criticism, uh, Macron turns back and sort of has this moment of humility where he recognizes failure, when he says that he will change. Um, and, and he's doing that again during uh, this uh, COVID crisis that he has mentioned some uh, of his own failure. 
And yet, you know, it's, it's hard to know whether uh, this is just pragmatism, whether this is in a way cynicism on part of, of Macron of having these two hats of the, the, the president in his Elysee Palace and at some point being able to say, I understand you. So I, I would love your, your take on that. And, and whether or not Macron is capable of change, he's talking about his own change. My second point deals with Macron during uh, COVID-19. What, what is the, the impression, the, the public opinion? So it's, it's actually quite hard to make an, um, an informed um, evaluation of what's going on. There's clear things that have worked for him, for his government. We have a strong state, we have a strong public sector. The, um, the, the, you know, the health system in France functioned and, um, and uh, a lot, th there was no breakdown of the health system. You had patient transfers in other regions, you had patient transfers to Germany, to other countries. And yet, um, you know, dissatisfaction of the French public is here. You have uh, uh, now th only 33% of French people who say they trust the government in this crisis. It's down 20 points in just a month. So you have really an unhappy uh, public um, that feels they've been lied to on masks, they've been lied to on testing, they feel there's some incoherence coming from the president, and yet there's a fragmented opposition. So I really wonder uh, what will come out of this crisis politically and whether or not, it's actually hard to evaluate whether this has weakened Macron or strengthened Macron. I would love your opinion. And my last point maybe um, is that I see Macron as looking at this crisis as um, both mortal danger, but also unique opportunity. So it's a mortal danger for the European Union. He said it repeatedly. Um, for the cohesion of the, the EU, but it's also a mortal danger for the international order. Both uh, President Macron and uh, Jean-Yves Le Drian, the French uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, have talked about the return of nationalism, the competition between US and China, the risk uh, for the world order. But they also see both Macron and his government behind them a unique opportunity to push for European solidarity. Uh, Macron talks about a moment of truth for Europe, um, where uh, everything could change for the better if only you had solidarity between North and South, uh, between hard-hit country and, and, and not that hit, uh, not that hard-hit countries. But also an opportunity to push for international cooperation. He's asking for a support package for Africa or for an IPCC for health issues, uh, human and animal health. So he, there's a lot of propositions out there and it's typically Macron, it's hyperactive. Sometimes it does not prioritize very well, but yet it puts forward a whole lot of, of proposals. And, and once again, Bill, um, given that you've seen him up close, um, which one do you think uh, Macron is most likely to push? Where do you think this is going? And is this an activity that he can really sustain and, and bear the fruit of? I'll stop here. Now let me just come in after uh, Celia has laid all that out because I think Celia has given us a great uh, roadmap for the discussion and we've also had um, some questions coming in from part of the audience, a couple of which dovetail with the first points that Celia was making on the domestic front in France. So I'll, I'll put those together for you and then we could maybe perhaps move uh, onto the larger picture that Celia was talking about and bring in uh, Constanza and uh, Giovanna because that will touch on uh, the EU and I, I've made a note of uh, the, the points that Celia has made here because a couple of our, um, our uh, audience members have asked uh, questions about um, uh, France itself and given what you've said and what Celia has said about the um, presidential de Gaulle model that, um, uh, that uh, Macron has adopted for himself um, his ability perhaps to learn lessons from his failures and attempt to change. You know, part of the question is, does he learn uh, these lessons for himself or does he think he can apply them more broadly uh, to France? And so we've had a question from Ellen Wasilina, who is the CEO at the Transatlantic Global Advisory. And she asks, um, Bill, how you see France and reform itself, not, and also reforming for the EU? And she's asking about what challenges Macron will face in the upcoming presidential elections. 
given all of these issues that we've sketched out about rising nationalism and anti-immigrant and um, uh, migrant sentiment, and this on top of uh, COVID-19. And we've had another question uh, from Fusun Turkmen, a professor at Galatasaray University in uh, Turkey, who's asking, what does the relative silence of Marine Le Pen during COVID-19 seem to indicate? So these are all kind of questions about how um, Macron will be able to apply uh, his leadership style and his ability to learn lessons and this test that he is facing on the domestic front uh, more broadly to uh, uh, France and the future prospect of reform itself. I mean, this will now, all, of course, be tied up to COVID-19. So perhaps you could give us a little bit of your thoughts on that, Bill, and then we'll move on to some of the broader international perspective. And thank you, Celia, for uh, such um, uh, a detailed commentary. Well, just to uh, respond to uh, Celia's uh, points, uh, I think it's, it was interesting during the course of our conversations, I asked him about uh, leadership. He mentioned De Gaulle, of course, um, uh, and others that I spoke to, such as uh, Hubert Vedrine, who had been the chief of staff for, uh, for Francois Mitterrand, uh, told me a very um, interesting conversation that he had with Macron saying, how should I best uh, demonstrate leadership? And uh, uh, Vedrine said he told him, well, when uh, Mitterrand was facing a lot of criticism and domestic pressure. He disappeared for several days in order to reject the sense that, oh, I'm, he's, he's disappeared to think big thoughts about the future of the country. And Mitterrand, of course, had this very uh, monarchical aura in the belief that the French love their president to be a king. And it was interesting, Macron's response was, how can I do that today? You know, there's social media everywhere. I'm on 24 seven, if I try to disappear, people will think I've died. Um, so he, he feels that it's an entirely different uh, uh, set of challenges. Uh, as Celia mentioned, the lack of trust in government, and I think we're seeing that everywhere, probably uh, with the sole exception of Germany, uh, where they have, uh, the, uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel, given her scientific background, has demonstrated a clear and concise understanding about the nature of this uh, virus. And uh, the German people feel uh, very uh, comfortable and reassured by her leadership. And the fact that Germany has had many fewer fatalities is quite significant. Um, in the case of, uh, of France, I think with their, even with their centralized system, it's remarkable that they've gone through this uh, period of uh, uh, strict lockdowns, uh, and most people seem to be abiding by it, uh, even though they, they are very rebellious by nature, as we've seen with uh, demonstrations against Macron's reform period. Uh, how he will come out of this, uh, it's unclear. He fee has felt all along that the secret of uh, modernizing France, pushing through this re these reforms, was a precursor to revitalizing Europe. First of all, convincing German, uh, Chancellor Merkel and uh, the German people that France is capable of reforming of, uh, uh, and, um, and doing what, uh, what needs to be done in order to, uh, to show a leadership with Germany uh, for the European Union in the next phase. And I think this is why the, the summit tomorrow is split between the wealthy creditor countries uh, in the north, led by Germany and the Netherlands, and um, uh, countries like Spain and Italy in the south, who are pleading for a uh, dramatic recovery fund that will cope with uh, uh, the aftermath of the pandemic, is uh, could be a turning point in the fate of the European Union. Macron recognizes this. He knows that uh, this is key to uh, the success of the European Union and indeed the success of his presidency because he always told me that he was in a race against time. He felt that there would be a test that would come up to Europe that would be even bigger than uh, the Great Recession uh, period that led to the Euro crisis after 2008, 2009. And of course, uh, at least he never imagined or never confided in me that it would be the nature of this global plant pandemic. But the crisis is here, it's testing European unity, just as like it's testing international cooperation. And how he performs uh, 
uh, in the next days and weeks and months, I think will be uh, the key to his presidency because we see um, populist nationalists on the rise everywhere. Uh, Victor Urban has basically turned his uh, state into an authoritarian regime. The first time a European Union member has, has turned away from democracy, he's supported by that, by the government of Poland. <clears throat> And uh, what happens in France and other countries is uh, is rather uh, alarming. Thank you, Bill. Um, perhaps as we go along, we can pick up um, <coughs> again on some of uh, these issues. I think you've made it quite clear that it's too soon to say uh, what his chances are in the presidential election. It depends very much on um, where he is, where we all are with uh, COVID-19. And perhaps the best explanation uh, for the question about why Marine Le Pen is uh, being um, quite silent at the moment is that she's probably waiting her moment as well to see how this plays out. You know, one can um, use this for political points if uh, Macron is seen to falter. So as you said, this is a huge test of his uh, presidency. Turning over to Constanza, you said uh, yourself how important this whole relationship is between France and Germany and how Germany uh, was also looking for proof that Macron was really serious about reform. And there's been you know, quite a lot of discussion uh, about the nature of the relationship between Macron and uh, Chancellor Merkel. Obviously two very different people, uh, a large age difference, very different styles. And perhaps Constanza, you can offer your perspective from the viewpoint of Germany on uh, Macron, his leadership style, and how he's generally doing as well as you know, how uh, this uh, test of COVID-19 is playing out from Germany's perspective on the European stage. Sure. Well, uh, thanks again, Bill, for a, a fascinating book, which I, I also read uh, with great pleasure. Uh, and I, I hope it, um, it gets a great uh, reader response as well. Um, let me just perhaps begin on, uh, on the point of the rebellious French and, point, and, and, and note that the lockdown conditions in France, Italy, and Spain are far more severe than they are in Germany. We're much closer to the Swedish model. The Germans are walking and jogging and congregating in parks and being, you know, pulled on their ears by the police, but they have much greater freedoms. And on the point of everybody loving Merkel, well, let's not forget that we had that at the beginning of the, the refugee crisis in 2015 as well because Merkel made the Germans feel good about themselves and then things went badly for a while. And, you know, and that started, that was the beginning of the AFD and a huge political crisis from which arguably Germany still hasn't quite recovered. Although the AFD like Marine Le Pen is currently uh, sitting in a corner and sulking and or biding its time. Now Fiona, on your question, I think that the, the Macron-Merkel relationship reflects the classic sort of uh, disparities of the Franco-German relationship, which is that France is a presidential democracy, Germany is a parliamentary democracy. France is a centralized country, we're a very federal country. So Merkel has s significant constraints in, in, in the way that she makes politics and policy that a French president just doesn't have. She has to, uh, she has to marshal her coalition partner, she has to uh, marshal the states, uh, she had a significant populist movement in her own country to keep at bay that was going to exploit any opportunity it got, um, particularly where they thought, you know, uh, a, a sort of there was an over exposure to Europe, uh, sending money to the South. That's the kind of thing that the AF is oxygen to the AFD. Yeah. So Merkel had to be very careful on that account. And then there is another uh, German tradition that is not so much a French one, which is that French chancellors have always traditionally seen themselves as balances between the different parts of Europe. And particularly, and I think particularly for Merkel, between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And then finally, there were very real policy disagreements. Um, I mean, you know, the German commentariat to which I belong was a little bit in love with Macron at the beginning. You know, he kept giving these fabulous policy speeches that we always wish that Merkel would give. The man had a vision, the man had ideas, proposals. And we were sitting there saying, my God, you know, we wish the chancellor would do just one or two of these. Yeah. But then you see him saying in an interview, Orban is the man I have the most interesting exchanges with. He's the one 
that my thinking most closely aligned with, and the Germans were all saying, what the actual? Or the Russia reset, which people were tearing out their hair over in Berlin. So there, there are very genuine policy disagreements. Now, I agree that this is a make or break moment, and I just want to point out, and that's, this is my final point, that, the, that Merkel had actually, uh, a couple days ago, in a, in a televised press conference, um, made some very interesting remarks on, on the question of how to deal with this. She said, for one, um, it was unquestionable for her that there would be solidarity and, I quote, more solidarity from Germany, and that, that was, this was not just a question of values, but in Germany's national interest. She made it very clear that she thought that the EU budget should be completely rewritten and might have to be larger. And the Spanish have put a very interesting proposal, I mean, a very bold proposal on the table for tomorrow's summit, which essentially suggests a 1.5 trillion euro, um, not neutralization of debt, but neutralization of spending. In other words, a common spending fund. And in that, in that context, just sort of one last quotation from Merkel in that televised address, she said that it was unfair and inappropriate for people to suggest that the southern countries should not receive more transfers because they had in some way, um, you know, that they were in some way in fault, at fault. This was a pandemic, a national a catastrophe that had happened to all of us in the same way. Uh, it had nothing to do with moral hazard. And so I, I think that she is likely to be a positively minded, open minded broker at tomorrow's summit. I hope she is. Thank you so much, Constanza. <clears throat> this is a really great um, perspective on uh, the German vantage point. And Bill, before I bring you back in, I'd like uh, to turn over to um, Giovanna De Maio um, as um, a, 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 an observer of one of the uh, the southern countries that um, Constanza has uh, noted here, um, uh, at least a country that's slightly divided between north and south uh, in of itself as well, there's been a very different relationship uh, between um, Italian leaders and uh, President Macron than there has been between President Macron and Chancellor Merkel in spite of all the different uh, styles and also the complexities that uh, Constanza has laid out. Um, I mean, we know that in Italy there's a very complex uh, coalition arrangement. We've seen Prime, Prime Minister Conte um, himself trying to grapple with this uh, as he's had to deal uh, with the crisis in Italy, which, um, as we all know, along with Spain, has been the hardest hit in Europe by uh, COVID-19. But we've seen in the past uh, members of that uh, coalition uh, government, uh, De Maio from uh, the Five Star Movement and Salvini from the Lega, actually take on Macron directly at different points, even trying to undermine some of his policy, uh, policies and to try to take advantage of French domestic politics, including the Yellow Vest movement at different points, aggravating the relationship and making it kind of clear that there you know, is um, a lot of policy difference, a lot of personal differences in style between France and Italy and um, harking back to uh, some of the past tensions between uh, the two countries. So I wonder if uh, Giovanna might give us um, a quick perspective on how it looks from a more southerly perspective on, uh, on Macron and how the Italians have been reacting so far, particularly ahead of this uh, meeting that we have tomorrow. Thank you, Fiona, and congratulations, Bill, for, for the book. I have just a couple of comments on Italy-France relations and then the last questions to, uh, to Bill uh, on this. So for sure, the coexistence of populist and nationalist um, in the coalition government between Five Star and League for the first um, eight, you know, 14 months, starting from uh, March 2018, created a sort of difficult relations with the European Union because both these forces had a very, very Eurosceptic views because of uh, opposition to austerity policies, but also uh, different views on how uh, the migration uh, crisis should have been uh, dealt. And therefore, um, what's fascinating with the relations between Italy and France is that both countries actually share an interest of getting together over, for example, budget issues, 
and a migration crisis, but they struggle uh, of finding a common perspective because of both political relationship of these two kind of the two leaders of nationalist and populist movement with Macron, but also some competition dynamics, especially in Libya, where France and Italy um, are competing over how to deal with a post crisis, uh, post civil war scenario. And as you mentioned earlier, one of the biggest uh, crisis moment between Italy and France was uh, followed, um, it was in uh, February 2019, when uh, the Five Star Movement leader that then was the Minister of Economic Development, Luigi Di Maio, actually went to Paris and met with the leaders of the Yellow Vest movement, directly uh, undermining the leadership of Macron. And also, and Macron actually called back the French ambassador from Rome for consultation. And the Five Star Movement and the Yellow Vest were actually accumulated by a sense of anti-establishment and a quest for more democratic participation and joining decision-making. So now, and of course, on, on the other level, the nationalist uh, Salvini was uh, pairing up with Marine Le Pen, especially after the EU election in May 2019, and they created a common um, formation in the European Parliament called Identity and Democracy. So both strengthening this feeling of anti-immigration. So in the post-COVID, uh, after the outbreak of COVID, actually, what seemed to me that at least Italy and France were coming together on a more um, a common position, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Europe summit that is coming up tomorrow. Um, uh, Italy seemed to be very supportive of, of the French uh, idea of European Recovery Fund. And moving forward, uh, Italy, of course, would love to be like, more on this sharing um, uh, risk, but also prosperity for moving forward. And I was wondering if Bill could give us a sense of how he sees the relationship between, between Italy and France moving forward in light of this more opportunistic but more Euro pro-European approach that uh, the contest government number two has been putting in place um, so far. Thank you. Thank you so much Giovanna. So Bill, if you'd like to respond to what Constanza and Giovanna have said and then I'm going to bring in a couple of more questions uh, that we've got from the audience. I think what's interesting about the profound differences between uh, Macron and Merkel is uh, his sense of disappointment. He felt that uh, he had an implicit bargain uh, that if he pushed his country, France, to, uh, to uh, undertake these uh, major ref economic reforms and prove to Germany that it was capable of doing so, that Merkel would respond with a with a much more uh, ambitious um, approach toward uh, a uniting Europe. I think the model he had in mind was uh, uh, what Chancellor Kohl did in pulling his people along toward the uh, European single currency at a time when, uh, uh, when uh, Germans, 70% of the Germans wanted to keep the Deutschmark. And uh, Merkel, of course, who's a very cautious leader who follows uh, in line uh, with uh, with public opinion, was reluctant to get a, ahead of the uh, people. And in, in their conversations, he told me, he insisted that Europe must be treated as a political community and not just a, as a common market uh, in which uh, wealthy countries can trade and try to get richer. Uh, it's interesting that 20 years ago, when I was based in, uh, in Berlin as a correspondent for the Washington Post, people were talking about Germany and the Netherlands as the sick men of Europe because uh, their economies were stagnant, uh, they had antiquated uh, industrial infrastructure and bloated uh, social welfare systems. And then they, they had a surge because of the, the single market, their, their, the surge in their exports turned them into the economic powerhouses of today. And now when uh, the argument is made by Spain and Italy saying, come on, we need some help, uh, Europe uh, show some solidarity, the so-called moral hazard argument is invoked when in uh, Germany and Netherlands, why should we reward bad behavior? And as Constanza pointed out, this is not bad behavior. Everybody is afflicted by, by the uh, pandemic. And Macron has tried to say, uh, you can't think of Europe simply as a marketplace. Um, and it, it, we have to show, 
solidarity. I mean, in going back to the Euro crisis, uh, with the first bailouts that were funded largely by German money, uh, a lot of that money went to bail out German banks. And uh, there's a lot of resentment still today in Greece because all that mo a lot of that money did not find its way to help the plight of the, the Greek people. I think where we go uh, from here, this is why he feels that Europe has to uh, coalesce behind a, a political community vision for itself. And when he, t he told me last uh, September that if it doesn't do so, that Europe could disappear, Europe as a political project. And I wasn't the only one he told this to. He gave a speech to French ambassadors in late August saying that Europe could be obliterated. He gave a, a revealing interview to The Economist in, at that time as well, saying Europe was on the precipice <clears throat> unless it, it moved forward. And I think where his, he's been very frustrated is that he hasn't been able to convince other leaders of the um, urgency <clears throat> to uh, transform Europe into a more integrated uh, continent in order that it can deal with the uh, challenges of the 21st century, not from things like pandemics, but also from uh, <clears throat> the rise of China, the, uh, the retreat of the United States from a global leadership role and the increasing uh, belligerency that uh, we're finding in Russia. And just one point to uh, answer Giovanna's question. I think it's interesting, they, France was competing for uh, influence in Libya because I believe uh, they were very alarmed by the situation in, in the Sahel uh, region just south of Libya. And they saw that as an integrated uh, force because uh, Libya has really descended into anarchy, uh, and not just civil war. And uh, this is actually fueling the uh, return of the Islamic State in uh, these Sahel countries, which is a direct uh, threat to, uh, to France's interests there. Thank you very much, Bill <clears throat> and Constanza and Giovanna. I'm going to bring in um, a few more of our audience members. And uh, Bill, you mentioned uh, the interview with The Economist, and in fact, uh, Sophie Pedder, the Paris Bureau Chief of The Economist, has uh, sent in um, a, a comment and a question as well, which touches on exactly what you just said. Sophie writes, my view is that Macron has been hugely impressive in articulating his vision for Europe and comments on the recent interviews he gave with uh, The Economist that you mentioned as well, and also the Financial Times. But she also uh, comments, just as you just said, Bill, that um, he's been rather less impressive in implementing the vision, and in particular, building the alliances that are needed to bring about the changes in Europe that he seeks. And she asks, what evidence do you see, particularly during the current COVID-19 crisis, which has obviously aggravated all the divisions, that he's able to do this? Now, there's a couple of other related questions, so I'll bring those in as well. Um, we have um, Andrew Moravchik, a colleague of ours, um, also from Brookings, professor at Princeton University, who um, is commenting on the same issue, saying that many European insiders feel that when they unpack Macron's proposals, they are either hopelessly vague or simply commit others to projects that benefit France, or at least cost it little. And some of the examples that Andrew uh, comes up with include common defence procurement, financial transfers from northern creditors to southern debtors and even aid to Africa and you Bill mentioned of course the Sahel and the interest then in Libya and Andrew Moravchik asks what is Macron's France prepared to sacrifice in order to make Europe succeed so this ties into uh, Sophie Pedder's comment as well about how um, Macron can overcome some of the divisions that ties in also to what Giovanna was saying as well from the Italian perspective and finally on this um, related um, set of questions. Uh, Dmitry Tranfilou, a professor at Kadehas University in Turkey, asks, who are the other leaders, if any, in today's EU from both the big and small states who Macron can work with to move the process of European integration further? And how could a group of this type help to propel Europe's agenda forward? So these might be good questions to tie together, especially as we look at tomorrow and uh, this meeting and how Macron is going to get any traction uh, with his counterparts. Uh, thank you. Well, just to uh, address Sophie's uh, uh, points, uh, 
how will he uh, <clears throat> try to implement his vision? I think that uh, he struggled uh, for months uh, trying to get Merkel and other leaders to join him in a in a much more in a eurozone budget, seeing that the 19 members of the eurozone area could coalesce in a way that would uh, help bring about this kind of strategic vision. That uh, did not go anywhere. Uh, now I think he sees the transformation wrought by the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity for Europe to rally around a whole new vision about how it's going to restructure its economy. So I think this is what uh, he's spending his time putting together now, but it's, uh, uh, and trying to get other leaders to see that uh, we can't go back uh, to the world that existed uh, just a few months ago before um, uh, this crisis. So Europe is going to have, have a major tra economic transformation that will be necessary, that will require a recovery fund of the kind that uh, we're talking about, more than a trillion dollars um, tomorrow. and. Um, it's going to require a lot more um, efforts, but as he, his, his belief that Europe must come together um, in a, as a political community is, is really at the, the, the root of his thinking, because he thinks that uh, otherwise, if Europe splits apart into smaller pieces, it will not be able to compete with uh, the big powers and the challenges that we face today. Um, now, what is France's uh, contributions? I know there's a lot of cynical commentary about uh, uh, Macron's blizzard of proposals uh, over the last two years uh, to transform Europe um, and how it helps uh, France. But I think he realizes now with the exit of the United Kingdom from the EU, France is now the uh, major military power on the European continent. Um, and he has offered um, <clears throat> a, uh, to uh, share France's nuclear deterrent with other European countries. They've been skeptical about uh, responding to this because they don't want to uh, scare away, uh, to do anything that would drive the United States away from its, uh, its security commitments in Europe. Uh, but Macron is, uh, is at least doing the thinking uh, for the future, proposing this uh, and putting it together. He and Merkel, um, had negotiated uh, the new French-German treaty that was approved last year. And in a very little uh, remarked uh, part of the preamble, it says France will make, if Germany is attacked, France will make all means necessary available to defend Germany. And when I asked him in an interview, does this mean that you are extending France's nuclear deterrent to protect Germany? And he just smiled and he just said, uh, that's a very interesting observation, um, you know, he says, but nobody else is picking up on that at the time. Uh, but I think this is where France is going to be, is willing to be the military, offer the military leadership uh, for Europe. And of course, uh, when he says that, um, people cynically remark, well, that means uh, they want, uh, he wants uh, other European countries to buy French military products or to, uh, to do uh, support their army and um, in places where uh, France has its interests, such as West Africa. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, on the issue of uh, the United States, um, which uh, you've touched upon as well, and I thought maybe we could bring Tom back in on this um, too. We've had um, a question about, um, from uh, Sana Bjorling, uh, reporter Dagensnieter, who's asking, is COVID-19 the first big crisis in a post-American world? And how will the absence of American global leadership affect power structures? So that really touches upon the issue that you've just raised at the end of uh, your commentary there. And um, I think, you know, perhaps that might push out the discussion a little bit uh, into how uh, Macron has approached his relationship um, with President Trump and with the United States, especially in light of uh, what you're saying about France um, 
realizing that it's now the major European military power, that it has the force de frappe, its own independent uh, nuclear arsenal, and it might have to play a different role in the future, especially um, in the absence of the UK, uh, perhaps from uh, broader um, European uh, military structures. Um, obviously, um, you haven't mentioned NATO and about how France um, perhaps sees its position in NATO at this point. So I'd be interested if you could expand out a little bit about this bill, um, picking up on um, the question we've also had from uh, Sanna Bjorling and what you've just uh, said about um, the, the perspective on the United States. And perhaps we might also bring Tom in because Tom has been writing uh, quite a lot about this um, himself uh, with others um, and articles that some of our audience members might have read recently. And then we have a final question before we finish up that's much more specific about um, President Macron himself and I'd like to bring um, you back to that before we before we wrap up. Uh, fine. Uh, well, to, re to uh, answer that question about uh, the post-American era, it's, uh, Macron has um, believe for some time that it did not begin with the, the Trump administration, the turning away uh, by America from a global leadership role. He really believes that it predates that, goes back to uh, even uh, the uh, end of the George W. Bush era and throughout the Obama administration that he felt that there was a turning away from Europe and that Europeans must come to realize that at this stage uh, they can no longer believe that the American people will support coming to their defense um, um, in, the, in the future, and that if Europe is going to develop as, a, as a, an important uh, global entity, it needs to be able to protect and defend its own security interests. And this has been echoed by Chancellor Merkel and other leaders, it's time for Europe to, uh, uh, to take care of its own destiny. Uh, but very little has been done because of the, the, the re reluctance of, uh, of European taxpayers to, uh, to, uh, to fund a major military role. In that sense, France still continues to be, uh, at least sees itself as, as projecting a major strategic role in the world. It still has interests out in the Pacific uh, with more than one million citizens living there, and so that they have a an aircraft carrier, Charles de Gaulle, that, uh, that is floating through the Asian seas. So I think this is in what is becoming more and more of a post-American era, or at least a, an era in which there is no dominant uh, power, uh, that it's important for Europe to, um, uh, to start developing its own capability to uh, defend its interests against I had at a time when China, Russia, and the United States will be competing um, uh, for their own interests and, and may indeed see uh, ways to exploit Europe uh, for, their, uh, for their own power needs. Uh, so I think this is, uh, this is uh, what needs to be, uh, this is how uh, one see, needs to interpret uh, Macron's belief in uh, what he talks about as Europe's strategic autonomy, which is a vague term, but I think he really sees it as a way of moving into the post-American era where Europe can no longer depend on the United States and the Atlantic Partnership um, as the basis of its uh, peaceful and prosper prosperous order. Bill, before I turn it over to Tom, what about NATO? Um, I mean, France is, is notorious from the time of de Gaulle about having, you know, something of its own perspective on this. It's pulled out of uh, some of the military command, come back in. There's always been something of an ambiguous uh, relationship, probably for all the reasons that you've just outlined. But did um, uh, President Macron say anything specific to you in any of your interviews? Well, I think, uh, no, he was reluctant to denigrate uh, NATO. And I think, uh, well, the, the interview that he gave to Sophie for The Economist, in which he used this term that got a lot of circulation, that NATO is brain dead, I think was a reference to the lack of his frustration over the lack of consultation on what to do in Syria, um, that the United States, uh, the Trump administration <clears throat> had uh, surprised its allies by, by withdrawing support uh, for uh, their Kurdish forces in, in eastern Syria. 
which left uh, French troops very vulnerable because they had several hundred special forces there and uh, were, and I think he was angry and frustrated over that. And that, that showed, he says, what, what does NATO mean if there's no consultation over such a serious matter? He says, this could lead to um, a, a pot prospect of uh, war between a NATO ally, Turkey, and Syria. And if Turkey tries to invoke Article 5, does that mean we have to go to war against uh, Syria uh, just because of this uh, decision? So he's, uh, he's saying that these are considerations and whether Article 5 can, uh, um, whether people can trust uh, and put their faith in Article 5 anymore is an open question that's been, been around since uh, um, I would say the early 80s. I remember a conference in which Henry Kissinger as Secretary of State was saying uh, when it was asked the question of will, will the United States use nuclear weapons to uh, <clears throat> um, uh, if, uh, if uh, Germany is threatened, um, he said, you know, of course not. And that shocked everybody, but it was basically revealing something that most people suspected was the case. Thank you, Bill. I wonder, Tom, if you want to just give a quick comment and then I'll go back to the last question, which is pertaining to Macron himself. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. And thanks, Bill, and everyone. This has been terrific. You know, I think it's an it's interesting point to pick up on just what Bill said about the economist interview in NATO, because um, I think, you know, after Trump was elected, France and then Macron was elected, you know, had this sort of view of, of Trump. Obviously, they were worried, but they thought they could be sort of pragmatic and work with him. And I think as time went on, Macron used some of the uh, features of America first, like the ambivalence over NATO, to make a case as to why Europe needs to do more. So in a way, he thought that this was, uh, you know, had a, a positive side effect for Europe. It could be used as a mobilization device. Um, I don't think he actually believed that Article 5 was completely hollow, or wasn't going to work. Um, I thought there were some concerns there, but he thought he could push it in the right direction. I think what the COVID crisis has done is really illustrate that there is a price for Europe with America first, right? That this is a crisis where you really have no international leadership coming from the United States. You have the president doing many things that are counterproductive or damaging to the overall effort. And so I think he's probably more worried now than he has been my guess at any time in his presidency to date. And this is not sort of a fading of American leadership that could be used to push Europe forward. I mean, that might happen, but the much more likely case is that it really damages European interests. So, you know, as someone said earlier, the crisis is here now, but we've all said about how well, you know, Trump handled the crisis, that moment is upon us. And I think, you know, that will affect Europe quite dramatically. Um, the second point, the final point, Fiona, is just that I think if you look, I think we have a little bit of a reprieve, right? Because if you look at this year, um, international cooperation is really important, hasn't really happened, and, but it's much more important next year, right? So the really hard decisions for the alliance, for Europe, for the world as a whole, uh, working together, you know, on a vaccine, on therapies, on coordinating economic recoveries, on helping developing countries that are still very vulnerable, those hit mainly in 2021, which I think just illustrates this big question about the direction that America will go. Um, so I, I imagine that's probably very much in his mind too. Thank you, Tom. Uh, so the last uh, question, um, Bill, for you um, is from uh, Vivienne Walt, who is the Paris correspondent of Time magazine and who's twice done uh, big cover interviews for Time on Macron. And so she's bringing it back to um, the man himself. And she's wondering, uh, Vivienne, uh, what, Bill, you think about the one thing that Macron said to her in her latest interview with him. She had asked him why he cannot ever shake his president of the rich tag. And Macron brushed it off as a, peculiar, a peculiarly French trait. He said to her, we are a country where we like leadership and we want to kill the leaders. She said, is this an easy way out for a leader who is consistently regarded as arrogant and too cocky, just brushing this off? Or she asked, is there, in your opinion, Bill, something peculiarly French about the drumbeat of criticism against Macron? Uh, 
it's uh, <clears throat> it's interesting. He was uh, shocked uh, during the Euro Yellow Vest uh, uh, protests. I recount one trip he made to Guillaume Velin in which people were carrying effigies of him, stabbing, uh, stabbing the effigies, decapitating it, and uh, and really insulting him in a frightening way. And he came back to the end and said, he was dazed and baffled. Why are the people doing this? And I once asked him, uh, what has surprised you most in your two years of power? And he leaned back in his chair for about 10 seconds and thought about it. And he just said, I would say it's the uh, acceleration of violence and uh, polarization in politics. I never anticipated this. He says, one thing to disagree with my views, it's another thing to, uh, to uh, decapitate me or threaten to, uh, to uh, kill the leaders. I think in his comment to, uh, to Vivian uh, during her interview for Time Magazine was probably a reflection of his frustration that uh, he doesn't, you know, you can't, you, you lose both ways. If you try to be a man of the people, uh, people say you're, you're not presidential enough. If you try to be too regal, uh, you're seen as too distant. I think it's true that, we, and it, I attribute this to his uh, lack of experience in politics, the fact that he was never elected to, uh, to office before, that he has a tin ear when it comes to uh, trying to understand the, the people. I mean, Jacques Chirac, I think, was a master at getting out and rubbing shoulders and making um, people feel good about themselves in a personal sense. Even Mitterrand had a had a skill at that, but uh, as did Charles de Gaulle. But uh, with uh, with Macron, he's much more of a philosopher, thinker type. He uh, cherishes his private time, does a lot of uh, thinking and reading, and um, I think he's he, by nature very distant. Um, I think maybe this was inculcated in, in him by the the period in which he was growing up and. Uh, fell in love with his uh, drama teacher during his adolescent years and the, the difficult relationship that they had in trying to sustain it. And that woman, Brigitte, is now his wife. Um, but he once said it was, uh, it was a very difficult um, uh, stage uh, that, that, that made him see the world uh, in a, a totally different light. So I think all of this uh, affects, but it's hard to be, uh, an armchair psychiatrist um, in trying to see uh, what works. I think his, the, what impressed me about it is that he feels there's a, he's got only a limited period of time. He wanted to push through all of these dramatic reforms in the span of two, two and a half years, because in the five year presidential, he felt that they had to bear fruit if he is going to be successful in getting reelected to a second term. And I think he, uh, failed to uh, recognize the warning signs and the frustration, the resistance and reluctance of people to embrace these, uh, these reforms as he insisted they had to do. Well, thank you so much, Bill. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that we're all out of time, but I think this has been a very rich conversation. And I think that all of the questions that we've had from uh, our audience also show how interested everyone is in this topic. And your book, uh, The Last President in Europe, um, I think is a, is it will give everyone a great overview of a very important person, a protagonist um, who is being tested personally, just as we all are in this very difficult time and who may be indeed playing one of the more important roles in Europe and if not on, on the global stage in the year ahead. So I just like to commend you on, uh, on the book. Um, actually, maybe your timing is better than you think in terms of uh, getting this out because we'll all be watching Macron and his counterparts very closely, not just tomorrow, but for uh, the coming months and I'd just like to also thank uh, my colleagues uh, before we all switch off uh, Tom as the um, centre director and um, uh, you know a, a great um, comments that uh, he made as well as for the introduction Celia for offering us uh, the French perspective Constanza for the important relationship that uh, France has with Germany and Giovanna uh, from the observations uh, from Italy and to everyone else in the audience as well to say thank you very much for such great participation and I'm sorry we obviously couldn't get to all of the questions that came in we've got um, a lot of people listening today 
but to everyone, uh, thank you, Bill. Thank you again. Uh, good luck with the promotion um, of the book. And to everyone, please stay safe and well. And we look forward at some point to be able to see, be able to see people in person. And I hope we all come through this test in the way that, uh, that we ought to with some ideas for how we'll move forward. So thank you very much to everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.